Good morning. Before we turn from fellowship to the spirit of worship, uh, we wish to thank Ken Nutting, representing the Nutting family for this glorious air conditioning that we have. Bless you. And welcome everyone from East Congregational Church, from First Congregational Church, and all of those who are worshiping with us online today. Uh, it's a lovely day and uh, we're here with a bittersweet time as we both celebrate and, and feel sad at the departure of our honorees, Tom and Kathy Matika. So thank you for being here. So now let's turn to a spirit of uh, prayer as we, as Angela plays her prelude. morning and welcome to our service of worship at the First Congregational Church in Milton. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Welcome to all of you in the sanctuary and to those watching over the live stream and Zoom. Um, and we're so glad you decided to join us today. And I would also like to extend a special welcome to our neighbors from, uh, from East Congregational Church who are joining us today for worship and communion. My name is Alex Hasha. Uh, I am one of the deacons here at First Congregational Church, and I'm privileged to be co-leading the worship today uh, in partnership with uh, Reverend Shelley Davis from East Congregational Church, who will now lead us in our opening prayer. Please join your spirits in prayer with mine. Holy, living, loving God, with thanks we gather this day. Thanks for neighbors near and far. Thanks for your steadfast love that calls us together. Thanks for the psalmist whose words remind us that it is good when your kindred dwell together in unity. Thanks for the blessings of this day. This day, the gift of this day and of this worship that we share together and offer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
And now please rise in body or spirit as for the call to worship. <clears throat> o oh God, we gather together today to worship you. We cannot see you, but we know you are here with us. Your creation is not a riot of beauty or color. Oh, is a riot of beauty and color, sorry. It contains such joy and such suffering. There is so much we will never know more than the tiny corner of it. O oh God, strengthen our faith that we may know in our hearts that beyond and behind what is seen, your orders will, your orders all things for good. Grant us the wisdom to delight in your will and walk in your ways. Always remembering that there is so much more delight than we see. And now, and now please remain standing and join in a rousing chorus of hymn number 353, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. I now invite us to pass the peace of Christ in a sign of unity and reconciliation, knowing that the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ is with us always. And for those of you worshiping with us through the live stream or on Zoom, please share with those around you a sign of peace and as well.
Today's scripture reading is from the 11th chapter of Hebrews, verses 1 through 3, and then 8 through 16. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. The elders in the past were approved because they showed faith. By faith, we understand that the universe has been created by a word from God. <clears throat> so that the visible came into existence from the invisible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place that, was, that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out with not even knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived in the land he had been promised as a stranger. He lived in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were the co-heirs of the same promise. He was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah received the ability to have a child, though she herself was barren and past the age for having children, because she believed that one who promised was faithful. So, def so descendants were born from one man, and he was as good as dead. There were, many, there were as many as the number of the stars in the sky, and as countless as the grains of sand on the seashore. All these people died in faith without receiving the promises, but they saw the promises from a distance and welcomed them. They confessed that they were strangers and immigrants on earth. People who say this kind of thing make it clear that they are looking for a homeland. If they had been thinking about the country that they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return to it. But at this point in time, they are longing for a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God isn't ashamed to be called their God. He has prepared a city for them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Coming to Christianity as an adult, uh, faith has not been an easy topic for me. I had a secular upbringing and I was educated as a scientist. And coming from that background, I understood faith in the religious sense as a sort of belief in magic. And I viewed science and technology as obviously superior replacements. I was aware of many more examples of the harms of faith than of its benefits. And uh, obviously, I'm here today. My, my thinking on this has shifted quite a bit, and I hope that by sharing some of my path from there to here, I can benefit people who share some of the same obstacles to faith that I had. Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist, has offered a contemptuous definition of faith that I, in the past, would probably have agreed with. Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is the belief in spite of even perhaps because of the lack of evidence. His emphasis on evidence marks his allegiance to the scientific perspective. Evidence is what's visible, and holding beliefs that are consistent with evidence is the essence of the scientific mindset. To put your trust in an invisible power is anti-scientific. Such beliefs may have been necessary and excusable for the ancient authors of the Bible. We figure because they lacked science and technology, they had little choice but to believe in magic and gods to shield themselves psychologically from the uncontrollable forces in their life. But we see ourselves as fundamentally distinct from them, beyond childish fantasies, because modern science has revealed the true nature of the world and given us the tools to finally tame it and secure our well-being. Of course, we may still acknowledge that faith could have some role to play in the realm of morals and values, but we'd be much more comfortable explaining such things as the accidental result of evolution. 
And where faith collides with evidence, we know science should always win. Many find Dawkins' definition persuasive because it's not hard, unfortunately, to find examples of people who do approach faith this way. It's true that many turn to religion for the comfort of simple answers, or more disturbingly, to take control by co-opting God's final authority. It's undeniable that a great deal of evil has arisen from that mistake. But that doesn't make Dawkins correct. Faith does not require belief that contradicts evidence. According to the dictionary, faith has nothing to do with evidence. It is merely complete trust or confidence in someone or something. I like the definition in today's scripture passage a little better, and I, I was working from a different translation, which I like even better. Uh, faith is confidence in someone or something. Uh, oops, is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now this positions faith as something that is needed when essential realities are invisible. But they don't ask us to ignore evidence. In fact, they suggest uh, where the evidence for faith may be found. It goes on, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was made out of what is not visible. It, what, is, what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now, the Apostle Paul made a similar statement in First Rom, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived, being understood from what has been made. So God isn't in the material world because God created it, and therefore God isn't visible. But we can still take this beautiful and terrible world that God placed us in as evidence telling a story about who God is. As I reflected further on the tensions between science, technology, and faith, a quote from the famous science fiction author, Arthur C. Clarke, grabbed my attention. It's, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. There's something about his juxtaposition of technology and magic that made me think about how even in modern scientific pursuits, we were still rooted in our ancient impulses for wonder and exploration of the unknown. I decided to go find the source, and it turns out that it's the third of three statements that have been dubbed Clark's Three Laws from an essay called The Hazards of Prophecy and the Failure of Imagination. So the laws are, one, when a distinguished scientist states that something is, is possible, they're almost certainly right. When they state that something is impossible, they are very probably wrong. Number two, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And three, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now, the first law struck me as speaking in a powerful way to the supposed conflict between faith and evidence. Now, I still do believe that when a religious belief is directly and conclusively disproved by scientific evidence, it should be discarded. But I also think that conclusive proof uh, is somewhat less common than we would think or like to believe. Clark's insight is that having a wealth of information and experience is often connected to failures of imagination. The more information and experience you have, the easier it is to come up with a credible story to explain what you're seeing. And the more convinced you become that anything you don't know, the invisible stuff, can't matter that much. And I, I've personally experienced this as I get older. Sometimes I wish that I could have the ignorance that would let me throw myself into projects at work without knowing what was gonna happen. But of course, it often does matter, the things that we don't know. Sometimes it matters more than anything. And that's why the future continues to surprise us. To my ear, Clark's laws express a sentiment similar to Paul's 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Now, the problem is not with wisdom per se. The Bible is full of praise for wisdom. I think it's a warning against wisdom without humility. Now, observations like these have moved me to evaluate biblical narratives with much greater humility and curiosity. We know so much that the bi biblical authors didn't, but while our ability to bend the physical environment to our wishes has progressed remarkably, our ability to discern, discern the true sources of well-being, human flourishing, peace, and love, and to focus our powers in that direction have progressed much less, particularly at a societal level. There's another way that living in the modern world sets us apart from our ancestors. In the internet era, the explosion of information that's effortlessly visible to us has no historical precedent. Always on personalized social media feeds and a 24-7 news cycle customized to every demographic can give the impression that all relevant facts are immediately available and that the truth is clear. The sheer volume of evidence makes us more prone than ever to lose touch with our humility. More and more we feel we have overwhelming evidence that those people are so terrible that Jesus commands to show compassion, turn the other cheek, and love your enemies couldn't possibly apply. More and more, showing compassion and curiosity outside your own tribe is, is seen as evidence of moral complicity, a kind of betrayal, rather than an, as an act of faith. We should remember that even though the amount of information that we are exposed to is totally overwhelming, the vast majority of what is real is still invisible to us. Daily acts of love and service are not newsworthy. When a teacher drags herself from bed at 4 a.m. to polish a lesson so it will be more effective for her students, you don't hear about it. When a safety manager goes the extra mile to design procedures that prevent injuries, neither you nor the safety manager will ever hear about it. All the places where the world is working as it should and where people sacrifice a little bit of themselves to keep things on track are invisible unless you're directly involved. Remembering this ought to offer some comfort from the despair many people are feeling, and it ought to restore our humility. This is not to say that we should never take a stand, that we should stay home and let God's will be done. But if we're tempted to claim that the ends justify the means, that coming out on top matters more than how we got there, because our cause is righteous, we should think twice. For Jesus to win the ultimate victory, he had to lose first. Modern life trains us to expect many things to come easily and quickly, but the most important things still take time and effort, self-sacrifice and faith. It has always struck me that while Jesus' miracles only changed the hearts of a few hundred people who witnessed them and stopped when he left the world, the way he inspired his followers to love one another has tra transformed countless lives over thousands of years. Perhaps that alone should be enough to inspire us to venture, venture a little way into the impossible, welcoming it from a distance. Amen. And now I invite the ushers to come forward to receive our offering. There are no offering plates there. Oh, there they are, okay. Okay. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks for all that you have given to us. We ask now that you receive our gifts back to you. Take them and use them to do your work and to share your love. Amen.
Gracious God, we give you thanks that you have called forth generosity from our hearts and from our lives. May these symbols of our generosity continue to extend your love far beyond our very imaginings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Can you hear? Ah, there we go. Well, you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the theory of that book is, is that sometime in their lives, people will change the course that they've been on. Something will disrupt their life, and they'll move on and do what really is in their hearts. Now, in Kathy's case, uh, I know that moving to California, I mean to Arizona, that she's decided that in her heart is a true conservative Republican. <laughs> and that, that she is going to be out there really working hard for that cause. And I know that, that Tom, we always thought he liked the beach and the sand, but now it turns out he just likes the sand. <laughs> so, but, but as we, we think about Kathy and Tom, the enormous number of things they've done for our church. They were part of the team that built Johnson Hall. They were, Tom was the construction manager for the new youth center. There are, there's a big generation of youth that Tom taught uh, the middle school Christian ed and got those kids on the right track in their faith. And then there's Kathy. Kathy is probably the longest serving trustee in the history of the United Church of Christ. It's like the mafia. Yes. She kick it out. And not only that, she was the, she's the treasurer. She sings in the choir. Her voice will be very much missed. She's just a wonderful leader of our church, a sane mind in a crazy world. And she and Tom are also awesome parents. Their sons, Dane and Jackson, have been very much part of the fabric of this church. We're not going to miss them quite so much. We're not going to miss them quite so much because Dane is moving back to Avalon Road where he will occupy a part of that house and provide welcome for the Matikas when they come home for holidays. And Jackson, well, he's going down to the Washington, D.C. area, but also he'll be available to come back and join us. But we're going to miss all of you desperately. So thank you for all you've done, for all the caring, for all the God in your heart that's come through with blessings. Nancy? In your thank bulletin, you. there is yeah. a blessing. So you can stand up for this part. Okay. <laughs> Yes, if you're able, please stand. No, just... Oh, just Just, the, just that. Yeah. As you can see, we planned this carefully. <laughs> the church is a family, united by the common recognition of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are all brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. and for a time, the First Congregational Church of Milton is our home. Like every human family, our church family is formed and reformed over time. As members are born, as they die, as members are adopted into our family, and as they leave our congregation for a new home in a different place. Kathy and Tom, Dana and Jackson have lived with us. We have shared each other's good times and bad. We have shared each other's joys and sorrows. We have lightened each other's heavy loads. Together we have laughed and we've cried. Together we have worshiped and praised God. Together we have lived.
We feel sorrow in your leaving, yet we rejoice with you in anticipation of this new phase of your life. We will miss your love and support, yet we know you will add much to the lives of those who will be your new church family, as you have added much to our lives. For you and for the whole family of God. And as we do the last prayer, let's raise our arms, extend our arms in blessing for Tom and Kathy. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the strength and the protector of your people. We humbly place in your hands Kathy, Tom, Dane, and Jackson of this congregation who are about to leave us. Keep them, preserve them, O oh Lord, in all health and safety, both of body and soul, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And thank you that they will be coming home for holidays and other occasions. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Please pray with me. Holy God, these symbols, this cup and this bread, have nourished us again. Nourished us in memory, nourished us in time, nourished us for all that lies ahead. May these gifts, O oh God, of your self-giving love, continue to bless us on this day and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our worship now turns to a time of prayer that we will share together, beginning with a sharing of any prayer requests that we have, and we invite those on Zoom to share in the Zoom chat, and also those on live stream to be attentive to the prayers of your heart. So we invite now any prayer requests from the congregation. So if you have a request, would you please indicate that so that we might receive it? Yes. All right, so we offer our prayers for Bob Marks, uh, a new client who is struggling with, who lives with muscular dystrophy and is struggling with the results of a new fall for our prayers for Bob Marks. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so a new knee replacement. And your first name? Grace. Grace. Grace will be having a knee replacement, and she asks for our prayers for that, as well as ongoing medical needs. Prayers for you, Grace. Steve. Two, uh, first, uh, a prayer for Elizabeth Butter, who is the daughter of the pastor of Wells uh, Village Church, who's in Uganda very difficult, a remote part of the country with very little support system and illness raging. So we pray for her safe return on uh, August 23rd. And then uh, prayers for Okay, so prayers for um, Elizabeth Butter, who is in Uganda on a Partners in Health mission um, or in internship um, in a very difficult situation. So prayers for Elizabeth and especially for her colleague Kayla, who fell ill this week. Um, but prayers for all those who are serving in remote areas with difficult communication and support systems. Yes, please. We've said a blessing for Tom and Kathy. Mm -hmm. Prayers for Tom and Kathy as they pack up and prepare to move to Arizona for this new chapter in their lives. Nancy. I'd like to pray for families who may be getting together during vacation and experiencing what many of us do, family disruption and pray for them all to learn to Yes, prayers lifted up for families gathering for vacations um, and not always having the easiest time of gathering, but um, for that time together, then it might be a time of renewal, but also a time of uh, grace with one another. Uh, Nancy in the back. We had in Toxfield, recovering from a fall, and they had a knee surgery. 
did not have to have a second surgery. He was doing well. His wife was had also fallen and had femur surgery. She was about to be released and didn't think about the water and fell again. As of Friday to Saturday, he didn't have enough surgery on the femur. So prayers for him and Joe will be the recoveries to be successful. Okay. Yes, we will offer prayers and continue to surround Anne and Joe Roman, both of who are recovering from falls, multiple falls, um, that they may indeed heal. Steve. Yeah, Jeff, my prayer is for all those people who are suffering from this heat, people who don't have air conditioning, don't have safe places, um, and for Jean Gammy in particular, who does have suffering from vertigo, vertigo. I spoke with her this morning and she asked that I pass on her readings to all who are in attendance. And I'm not making this up, especially that nice Frankles. <laughs> All right, so with Steve, we offer prayers for all those suffering from uh, the heat, not just here in Massachusetts, but across the globe in so many places, especially those who don't have access to um, air conditioning. We also pray for Jean, who is struggling with vertigo. Um, continue to surround her with our prayers as well. Yes. So additional prayers for Bob for all of those challenges around um, the delay for a prostate cancer treatment. Um, so his body and spirit, we gather close in prayer. Yes, please. but many people to hold in prayer. Yes, we will. Um, many of us know of or have family members who are aging, um, transitioning from in different ways in their lives um, and in need of many types of care and surrounding them. So we offer prayers in our hearts for those we know personally, but certainly for so many who do indeed um, have transitions as they age as do all those who love them. So for all of you worshiping with us through the live stream and on Zoom, we know that your prayers also are heard and held before our God. And so as we now gather together all of these prayers in our hearts, I ask you to please join your spirit with mine in prayer. Holy God, prayer is such a powerful way for us to communicate with one another and with you. So we pray that even as we send forth so many prayer requests, spoken, unspoken, those yet to find articulation, we also gather before you in silence to hear you, to be aware of your presence with us.
We give thanks, O oh God, that you have placed each of these people named before us in our hearts and in our prayers. Their needs for healing of body, of mind, of spirit. Our need for being present to new colleagues, to family members, to new friends we have yet to meet as we say farewell to friends we have known so long and our hearts ache. We pray, O oh God, this day not only for people we know, but for so many whom we don't know, but for whom we have an awareness of the struggles with heat or lack of affordable housing or any housing at all. For those who may have family members that it's hard to get along with and for those who may not have family members that they're in relationship with at all. As you continue to open us up, O oh God, to your love and the ways in which we are to share your love with others, we pray that you would indeed break us open even as that loaf of bread on our communion table was broken open this day, so that your love might both pour into us and through us to feed your people, to feed those we have yet to meet, to know that your power and your love indeed extend beyond our wildest imaginings. And within that, O oh God, and within this prayer, we give thanks that Jesus taught those first disciples to pray in words not unlike those we still say together even now as we begin to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, some announcements. First, we want to invite everyone following the service to head to Air Conditioned Johnson Hall, which is through that door and to the right, for a coffee hour and a celebration of Tom and Kathy's journey with us. Y'all come. RG likes it when I do that. Um, next week, our pulpit will be filled by Nancy Barber, who is preparing a very exciting sermon, and we all look forward to everyone coming and hearing that. Um, tonight at 7 o'clock on Zoom, uh, Susan Klinkenbeard, who, many, who some of you may remember, um, was a student pastor here, is uh, holding her ecclesiastical council on Zoom. Uh, we invite people to attend. Uh, if you're interested, you can either check with me or with Shelley or um, go to the uh, website for the um, Southern New England Conference, and there's a link there, I believe. 
And also, I'd like to thank uh, the, all of the task forces that continue to work and listen to the folks in our neighborhood and, and hear where God is calling us to be. And to remind all of you that uh, prayer walks are still uh, something that we're hoping for. And, and you know, take, take one a week and pick a new street, and uh, once, especially once the heat cools down a little bit. It's a wonderful thing to do, so, so please do more of that. Are there any other announcements? Well then, it's time for you to rise in body and spirit and join us again in a rousing version of 391, Be Thou My Vision. Now let me offer you this benediction. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And may we walk in faith until we meet again. Amen. Amen.